waiting for you, the fans, to let them in. Eh? They just come in alone. Oh no, they, I received some message now that says have... I'm waiting to, to be allowed to enter. Yes, so now we are at 50, 52, 55, okay. it's coming in. Yeah. Okay, very good. Good uh, afternoon everyone, good uh, morning for some of you guys. Uh, you are uh, assisting, attending to our uh, webinar, Trading for Sustainability of Dairy Farming. Uh, we uh, are very glad to uh, welcome you. Every All the attendees are coming in, so uh, for the ones that are already uh, in, uh, just uh, we will just wait a few, uh, a few minutes before, before starting. Uh, today, uh, you are um, over 200 that registered for our uh, webinar. Uh, we are glad to, all to have uh, four dairy men, dairy farmers uh, from the US, from Denmark, from Italy, uh, that uh, will uh, uh, tell about their experience uh, over the last uh, years. Uh, we did by did get more attendees coming in, participants, 87 is growing. I have some um, possibility to see that. If I did, we will. So as you know, uh, our event is broadcasted on Facebook Live as well. So you can follow um, uh, on, um, on Facebook too. Welcome also for all our Facebook uh, guys coming in. Coming in. Uh, we have uh, one more. We are very close to reach uh, 100 person coming in. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning for some of you on the other side of the, uh, the Atlantic, or uh, maybe very early in Asia too, or Oceania. We had uh, over 25 countries that registered. So we are very glad to um, welcome all of you guys for this uh, webinar. And we'll wait a bit more. Let's have a look on the, on the time. We'll, uh, good afternoon, good afternoon. I will just um, ask um, Coming up again, more people coming in. Welcome everyone, welcome everybody. Welcome to our webinar, Breeding for Sustainability of Dairy Farming. We'll start in a few minutes. Thanks uh, a lot for your time. We, You all know we are in a, uh, nearly all the world is in the same situation. We cannot travel much. We cannot organize um, open house visits, very difficult, but uh, we need to stay optimistic. Uh, there is new technology to stay in contact and to uh, communicate, so that's our idea, to be able to um, communicate and to um, be able to transmit. I will wait a few more minutes. I will. The fun? Yes. Go ahead, Claudio. Uh, I, I also want to say welcome to everybody. And I want to remember, uh, to remind to every, everybody here, that this is a COVID-free webinar, so you can join in. There's no, there's no chance to, to get in touch each other. So that's the reason why we choose our guests to be that far from each other, so they are uh, the, the social distance has been respected so far. So I hope we will have more and more people join in. Super. So um, most of you might have uh, recognized Claudio, Claudio Mariani. I will introduce you uh, already. I think it's a good moment. Uh, Claudio has been in our uh, genetic industry for the last 25 years. As you can see, he's still very young and uh, he's still. Uh, uh, doing uh, a lot, so he's been involved as well in, in pure breeding 
as much as in cross, very cross reading. Um, he's native from Italy. Uh, am I wrong to say you are from Monza? No, uh, yeah, you are correct. Uh, right. And, um, yeah. right place, um, uh, very close to uh, from uh, Milan. I'm not sure. And uh, yes, uh, you are used uh, to uh, be in webinars, uh, Claudio, because you are leading the CDF. CDF, would you explain a bit uh, what it is? Uh, in Italy? Oh, we started. Oh, we no. just started a, a Facebook group uh, about three years ago, but has uh, has been growing and growing the last year, of course, due to the COVID situation. And it's a group of farmers and technicians, and we discuss every issue about milking cows. And it's a, it's a fantastic group. So we do. Every once a week, at least, we do those live get together like we are doing right now, and it's a fantastic experience. We get farmers knowing each other, and they get in touch, and they share experience and questions and answers, and it's a very good way to keep the people uh, uh, updated and in touch, even if yeah. we cannot travel. Excellent, super. That's what we want to have uh, connections between uh, people, and this time we are happy that it's between many countries. So let's uh, introduce, I think we will stop. Um, let's introduce our four dairy um, uh, farmers. Um, first, um, Scott Opit from Hampton, Texas, is um, based east in the farm east, the place east of uh, Dallas. We have Gary Oldmundson uh, from Six Boys, uh, Gary from California. Uh, we have uh, Filippo Peveri from Sao Latte, a, a farm and a cheese uh, producer, very close to Parma, so of course, producer of Parmesan. And we have Gerd Lassen from uh, Silkeborg in the central uh, uh, Jutland, if I'm not wrong, yes, uh, in Denmark. So uh, thanks again for your time and your uh, time to be with us and to share your experience. Claudio? I'll let you uh, start. We are now easy over 100, 100 uh, uh, attendees, participants, so go ahead. Okay, thanks, Stefan. And uh, again, it's my pleasure to be here today with uh, you guys, so not only the four farmers that will answer our questions, but everybody that is connected with us, uh, both on the Zoom platform or uh, through the Facebook page of ProCross. So I hope we will have more and more people joining in. And the reason why we decided to have this webinar is that it's time to exchange some ideas and experience and about ProCross. ProCross has been in place since many years now, and we have many, many uh, farms all over the world uh, enjoying this uh, uh, new system of uh, uh, rotational cross breeding. And today we have the pleasure and the chance to host four farmers that uh, experience themselves from crossing their own farms. And uh, let me introduce them. Uh, Gary Osmundson from uh, California, that's already been paid by Stefan. And then we will have Gerd uh, from uh, Denmark, and we will have Scott from uh, Texas, USA, and then we will have Filippo from Parma, Italy. So, we will start with a small introduction. So, I will ask all of them uh, to say a little bit about themselves, and we will use uh, a slide that will give you an overview of their own farm. Please keep in mind that we will keep the rotational uh, system not only in the breeding broadcast, but also in answering the questions. So, we will have Gary first, and then Gary then Scott, and then Phil. So let's start with Gary, and Stefan, please uh, start with the first uh, slide. Gary, introduce yourself. Morning, good afternoon. Uh, Gary Osmondson uh, started uh, on the dairy in April of 1998. We started the program uh, the year after, and my wife and our four kids enjoying the cows, enjoying the progress. That's very good. Uh, Gert, you're second in line to make a short introduction of yourself. Hello, uh, I'm Gert Lesson. Uh, I'm second generation on my this organic uh, dairy farm. 
with uh, 340 Pro Cross cows. I live here together with my wife and uh, three of our five children. Um, I convinced my father to start uh, crossbreeding in 2002. So we've been crossbreeding for 18 years. Um, and the farm has been organic in 25 years. Okay. We have here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And now we go uh, to Scott. Scott, can you say something about yourself? Yes. Uh, I moved from Wisconsin to Texas 26 years ago, looking for warmer weather, and I found it. And uh, we have uh, been breeding Pro Cross since 2005. And uh, I also have a son and a daughter involved in our dairy operation. So Scott, you are a badger. You are not a, a, a longhorn. You are you are imported. <laughs> <laughs> is that right? That is you correct. Say, you say from Wisconsin, yeah. Yes. And, and thanks, thanks, Scott, for introducing yourself. And now get go to Phil, Filippo, uh, tell something about yourself. Hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm Filippo Feveri. I'm from Parma, Italy. I'm 26 years old and I'm a dairy farmer. Uh, we run a farm with my family in the family business. So we have a um, farm and the dairy, and all the, the people, family works in the, in the company. I am mine the cows and field with my dad. My brother is in the dairy, my sister is um, in the quality checking and also hospitality with my mom. Thank you. Excellent, Phil. And uh, well, I, I have to say that uh, you have to pay with a little bit of extra cheese next time I will visit you. So uh, this is not going to be for free. Thank you, guys. Let's start with the webinar, and uh, um, uh, I want to start again following the same rotation. I want to uh, start asking you something. So, Gary, you first. Uh, what breeds did you have before crossbreeding, and when did you start crossbreeding, and why? So, can you answer this, please, Gary? Yes. Uh, we have pure Holstein. Uh, before, this Holstein, we started the crossing because we weren't quite happy with the reproduction of the health science and the county and the urban crossbreed hybrid figure iteration of the health generic and we tried Holstein, Brown Swiss, Ayrshire, uh, about everything before uh, we started with my dad got the test to step on and we started it with the mocking yard. And Gary, uh, let me ask you: uh, Are you from from a, a, a farmer family? So you were born and raised on a farm. So farm, dairy farming is part of your life since the early years. Uh, how, how many old things did you used to have uh, at the beginning? Um, when I started. Uh, our first test day, uh, weigh day, was 241 cows. Milk. And, and did you milk the cows yourself? I I gave uh, I gave the guys days off on vacation at the very least, but not not for long. No, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Yes. Same question for you. Uh, uh, which breeds do you have originally? Uh, when did you start cross breeding, and why? Yes, um, we had uh, Holsteins, only only 100 Holsteins, but there was a very high uh, culling rate uh, and a lot of uh, veterinary costs. So we started crossbreeding in 2002. Um, in the beginning, just to achieve uh, healthier cows, uh, stronger born calves, and uh, and a higher longevity on the on the milking cows. Uh, that was the main goal. Gert, you also come from a, a farmer uh, family, so your father used to be dairy farming as well? 
Yes, yes, he was uh, the owner of the farm then, and uh, he was kind enough to start crossbreeding uh, before uh, before I uh, bought the farm. Uh, okay, so when 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 uh, the farm started crossbreeding, it was still under your father uh, guidance, uh, and then and then it came to you. Yes, that's that's very good. Thanks, Pierre. Scott. Uh, uh, I don't think I need to repeat the, the questions uh, exactly the same. Uh, where, which breed did you use to farm before crossbreeding, and when did you start, and why? Which, which, which was the leading reason for you to start crossbreeding? Well, we we started out with pure Holsteins, and uh, the, the biggest issue was getting them bred in our fairly harsh climate in Texas. We have six months where it's really too too warm but uh fertility was number one and call rates were right behind it so at the time you started uh, um, uh did, did, did you know a lot about cross breeding or was that uh, something that came up to your mind or did you hear about that then we will go we will go farther uh, into that well we we let Gary and his neighbors uh, figure out what worked and what didn't work. So we, we gave them a six year head start and then they kind of zeroed in on what worked. So we rolled right into uh, 100% from day one. So Gary, you are invited in Texas to enjoy a very good steak because of that good suggestion, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'll take him up on that. Yeah, 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 prepare, prepare. When COVID will be over, we will, yeah. get a, we will have a get together. And Filippo, uh, as the last one of this uh, first round, uh, same question for you. Which breeds did you start with, and when did you start first breeding, and why? So, yeah, we started with Pure Ostein. Um, we started eight years ago, first breed. And um, when we decided to build another farm, I was looking for a more rustic animal and more adaptable for low input feeding. Also, um, I was turning in the first farm in overcrowding, so Procross was the best alternative instead of selling and buying new animals. Okay, so uh, maybe not everybody got this one. You, you had a first farm where you started, but now there's a second farm. Yeah, yeah, so we, we make a contract with a retailer in Switzerland, a GBO, um, that we sell straight the products, the final product, organic parmigiano Reggiano, certified bio Swiss. And oh, you, you sell the cheese, cheese right? Cheese. Yeah. You sell yeah. the cheese, so you make cheese in, in, in your farm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, that's very good. Cool. Okay. Guys, uh, let's go more into a little bit of technical uh, issues. So start back to Gary again. Uh, Gary, can you name the three uh, best benefits you got from switching to Procra, according to your experience? For me, uh, uh, I think the biggest one that sticks out is uh, difficult cabbage. Um, it's not that they're gone. The amount of times that I get called at night because there's a problem that a lot of people To me, that's the biggest one that sticks out. And there's the benefits with just uh, the amount of cows or the percentage of your herd that's in the hospital for getting mastitis is less. And uh, a, a bigger, stronger, healthier cow. Uh, hard, to put a, hard to measure that. Uh, Gary, of course, you, you have employees in your farm. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I, I assume that your employees are also happy that uh, difficult calving has dropped so much. Yeah, yeah, we all are. That's enjoyed by everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is something typical uh, when 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 you drop so much the difficult calving. So all the people working on on different shifts. They are happy not to be wake up in the middle of the night or to have to assist the cow that is ready to kill. And 
And another thing I want to ask you, Gary, is uh, um, did you experience, of course, decrease in drugs uh, in your farm because you have less sick cows, you have healthier cows? So have you seen the, the consumption of drugs and treatments going down? Yep, yep. it kind of goes hand in hand when you, when you have less problems. have to have a special facility or area. You know, just healthier cows, easier doing cows, require less maintenance, less, less drugs, less ditches. I see. Uh, thank you, Gary. Again, uh, go to Gert and same question, Gert. Uh, the three most biggest benefits you got from from, from crop breeding is this whole process. So. Um. Uh, I think the biggest benefits are healthier cows in general, uh, and uh, better reproduction, and uh, and longer lasting cows. If yeah, if you can say it like that. Yeah. And uh, same question to you as well: Is did you see a decreasing in your usage of drugs or treatments or antimicrobials? through the years. So have you seen this uh, in, in your farm? Yes, and it's really important for us as organic farmers. It's very expensive to use uh, antibiotics and uh, yeah, these things. So, so for us, it's a really big thing that we don't have the vet come here very often. So yeah, we have a, we have a average veterinary cost of 50 euro a year per cow. Uh, including oh, 15, 15, 1, 5? Uh, no, 5, 0. Oh, 50, for, okay. For all, for all cows, uh, yeah, uh, and vaccinations and dehorning, everything, yeah. Oh, including vaccinations, of course. Yeah. That, that's very good, that's very good. Scott, did, did you experience something similar in your farm, like decreasing yes. the number of drugs, the usage of drugs? Yeah, I still remember... Uh, when our Pfizer rep stopped by, which now he's a Zoetis rep, but he asked me one day, he said, you're not hardly using any exceed. What are you using on your fresh cows when they get sick? And I said, exceed? He said, well, you're hardly buying any. I said, well, because <laughs> we don't have cows to treat. So. Mm. But, you know, the three big reasons for us was pretty much the same as, as Gert said, the and the health of colorings. Yeah. Those, those three comes out uh, very often speaking to crossbreeding farmers all over the world. So let's go to Filippo and ask him if uh, his main three benefits by switching to proper. Yeah, so I can say first of all, the vitality of the calf was amazing since the first cross calf. And I can say also, mm, progress cows are very adaptable animal with all the kind of hay used because in, for me, in Parmigiano Reggiano, we can just use dry feed or fresh feed, no silage. So the hay is very important in the winter time. And also I can say very strong animal. Yeah. Very good. Very good, guys. Yeah, back to Gary, and again, staying on the technical level. Um, I don't know if Stefan wants to launch his uh, survey right now. Stefan wants yes, to do that Claudio, now? Exactly. We would like uh, to have a bit of uh, feedback from our, from our audience. Um, audience. And uh, the idea is to, uh, to know, guys, where uh, your interest, where you're from. So I will start a, a quick poll, you will see right now. And uh, you just have to uh, to answer. Uh, it's a few seconds to take and to answer what you um, what you see, and then we will share what uh, uh, what uh, what are the uh, uh, the answer. So um, just uh, go ahead. Just tell if you are dairy producer, if you are feeding advisor, if you are uh, tell staff as well, veterinarian. Uh, it's uh, just um, uh, interesting for our four uh, dairy producers to know where you're from and what um, what are your 
background, there's, a, there's also some question about uh, if you're already crossbreeding, maybe already crossbred cows, maybe it's only heifers so far, just starting, um, and maybe some of you are still in pure breeding, whatever breed, um, and uh, mm -hmm. just interested in more info. And uh, the last question is about uh, if your AI service provider gives you information and option to crossbreed, uh, not only for cross, but also the, uh, the other, the, uh, uh, about crossbreeding uh, in, in, by your uh, service provider that will, that will give you a bit more uh, seconds uh, to answer. So, uh, so far I see a uh, majority of dairy, uh, dairy producers uh, that are on our attendees and we await a bit uh, more. Uh, a lot of you also are already already cross, cross breeding and, and uh, I must say also that uh, you already um, asked some questions and uh, those questions will be uh, taken care of by um, during the next question that Claudio will uh, ask um, our four host. Okay, just uh, now a few more seconds guys and we will finish the, the poll. Um, Of the majority of dairy producers uh, already crossbreeding and already getting uh, information and option to um, crossbreed. Okay, so for so now, I think we are back, Claudio. I think we can uh, proceed. Let's go. Very good. Thanks, Stefan, and thanks to the audience for uh, attending and participating in our mark and short survey. Uh, back to Gary again. Uh, Gary, there is a question that uh, uh, today is pretty much uh, important in every, uh, I would say in every environment and in every uh, farming situation, that is the usage of hormones or protocols or synchronization protocols. Uh, what's your experience about that, uh, and what's your experience, of course, related to your crossbreeding uh, animals, crossbred animals? So, uh, I kind of, I've moved everything backwards. Uh, a lot of people try to move it forward, start a, some sort of program early, maybe 45, 50, 60 days. We don't do, we don't do per service. We have a 75 days volunteer waiting period. So I went the other way. And I don't start a program, a, a synchronizing program, until 115 days if they're not, if they're not ready. For me, my, you know, I just think that the, the quickest way to kill peak production is by getting the cow pregnant. So let's let them get to the peak or through the peak, and then we'll start breeding them. And, uh, that's just my series, my take on it. So I use, I think, a lot less of the hormones. And also with the Procross, I feel like you don't need to use it maybe because they just they, they grow better flesh, maybe look better condition, and they, they come into heat most of the time on their own. But do you see, uh, do you see Gary in the milk consumer, so in the customer, do you see a raising concern about this topic? Uh, like people are getting more and more uh, concerned about farmers using or not using hormones in their farm? I, I haven't heard many of the consumers, everybody knows about BSD, but I'm not sure if the consumers know as much about GNRH or Utilize as, as they've heard about uh, BSD. So there's some milk advertised hormone free, but I would I would think the consumer associates that more with BSD and not GNRH. But I, I do, I think it is and will be an issue before too long. Everything becomes an issue. It will be before too long. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Gary. Same question to, to Gert. Uh, what's your 
position and your experience about using or not using your an organic farm. So uh, we have to remember all the time uh, to give your personal position about hormones in, in, in the dairy farming. And, and by having crossbred animals, I think this helps you to keep uh, you know, low usage or, or zero usage of synchronization protocols. Yes, we, we have no, uh, it's not allowed in the organic farming and it's not, uh, I don't think it's allowed in Denmark to use it as a, uh, as a protocol. You can use it on cows with uh, reproduction issues, but, but in general we have no, uh, no use uh, of, of hormones. Very good. Scott, your, your, your experience about that? We don't use any drugs at all. We just uh, tail chalk and the headlocks. And uh, when they come and eat, we breed them. And if they don't, we give them a different uh, occupation. Uh, look, looks very similar all over the world. And uh, Phil, what about you in Parma? You are also organic, right? Yeah, same in Gert. Uh, is not allowed to use hormone <coughs> for reproduction, just for reproduction issues. Like after birth, if you have some problem, you can use it. Yeah. Uh, going back to, uh, to Gary again, uh, uh, you know, Gary, well, uh, there are many scientific papers uh, published about crossbreeding, and, and the first one. Uh, actually came from from the six dairies in California, and you have been part of those uh, preliminary study. Now it's about almost 20 years ago now. So uh, my question is, how much the scientific papers, the published results, how much have uh, influenced your decision to keep going on crossbreeding? So by seeing the results published, have you been like assured or confirmed? In your decision to keep going in, in crop crop. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like I said, when we first started, we still, when we first started the pro cross, we still had some of the older crossbred animals that we started with before the Montreal yard and, and the like and this. And so to see on paper that what we liked better, which is pro cross, was also with the more profitable cow, was a little assurance for us. Uh, it just keeps on going. So initially, there was a lot of questions. Uh, University of Minnesota, Les, Les Hansen and all the crew out there, they, they confirmed what we saw as dairymen here in Oakville. That what we liked was also the more profitable. What we liked to look at and work with every day was the more profitable crop. So it was the assurance that we needed at the beginning to continue. And I've, I've never looked back since. And I never will. Yeah, 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 clear enough. Uh, before I switch to Gert, uh, uh, Gary, I want to, um, to put a couple of questions that raised from the audience, so from the web. Um, uh, one question is, do you maintain a batch of pure breed animals to maintain the crossing? Or once, uh, you, you know what I mean, or, or, or you just crossbred the whole farm and that's it? Yeah, so we crossbred everything. I started, jumped in with both feet, started everything, and we depend on Stefan uh, to, to have customers that maintain the purebred animals for us to give you property. Not everybody's going to buy into it, so there will always be some purebred animals. For Very good. There. Very good, Gary. Go to Gary now. Yeah, Gary, uh, we start again with the same question as before. So the the scientific papers published, the results being published worldwide, did they play any role in, in your decision to start or keep crossbreeding going? So did you did you uh, look at those numbers and those results with interest? Yes, I looked at it with interest. Like Gary said, it, it's a good confirmation that, that the travel you're on with your cows is the, the also scientifically prove that what you like to work with is what actually is uh, can be proven uh, yeah 
um, because there's, yeah, at least at that time when we started in Denmark, there was not much, uh, uh, yeah, there was a lot of other farmers shaking their heads uh, when I said I want to crossbreed my cows. Okay. And, uh, uh, Georg, since you are uh, organic, uh, I know that uh, part of the year your cows are on pasture outside. Yes, yes, they are, they are grazing almost six months a year. Yeah, uh, one question that raised from, from the web is about that. Uh, how is Procross on grazing season? And, and uh, then we will ask Scott about this. But first, your impression uh, here. How is Procross? Do they, do they perform well on a grazing season? Yes, uh, I think they perform well. They have a good must Popularity and uh, strength to walk a bit of distance to the fields, uh, and that's important. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, we got to Scott uh, down in Texas. Uh, Scott again uh, asking you uh, how much of your uh, uh, of the of the scientific papers, how much uh, they they were important for you to decide or to keep going uh, cross breeding. Well, primarily, it's just a validation of, of what we were seeing every day. So uh, it's 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 nice to see for sure. Very good. And, and uh, about the second question is uh, how Procross fits in a grazing system because that's your your daily operation is based on grazing or or you put the cows outside most of their time. So how do they fit into this system? Well, we were finding that the conventional Holsteins, they really prefer a feed bump over the grazing, and we had to get them a little hungrier than you really want them to be to get them to graze how you like them. So for the Pro Cross, they just, they prefer to graze, so you don't have to push them at all. That, that, that's a good thing to consider. And Filippo, the same for you. Uh, uh, you are recently involved into crossbreeding, uh, but have you have you seen any scientific results that was catching the eye, catching your attention? Yeah, yeah, I'm the last one, but uh, I saw research um, using Procross uh, instead of Holstein or brown cows uh, for the classification for uh, making cheese. Uh, they had like some good point for for the daily, so that's very important for us. And also um, a recent research uh, done by Padova University about um, the the emission of methane in atmosphere by cows. Uh, I remember called Bitante um, say. Right. Yeah, right, right. The, the carbon footprint. Yeah, the carbon footprint and the uh, uh, methane of cows. Uh, uh, some people told that is worse than methane of logistics. Right? But the, the, I, s I remember Bitan uh, uh, say that it's uh, like less dangerous methane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and about the grazing system, because in, in your farm, uh, you sell, you said before, you sell parmesan to the Swiss market and they, they ask you exactly to, to uh, feed the cows uh, with, I don't know, 90% of the feeding is going to be grazing on pasture? Or? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, the, um, the rule of the Swiss is that 90% of feeding of the cows has to be from forage, so dry or uh, fresh, and okay. 10% of uh, How much? 10%? Yep. And will be 5% in 2022, uh, 2022, sorry. Okay. Okay, uh, down to genetics, uh, uh, because here we, we, we always have to deal with genetics, like uh, Gary. Uh, normally, uh, some people would say uh, that crossbreeding is just putting different breeds together. 
And, uh, but of course, you know by yourself that it's not that easy. Well, it's easy, but it's not that easy. We cannot put, just put the bridge together and that will work. So we have to follow a rotational system. We have to keep the same rotational system and the choosing the right booth makes a difference, like in Berlin. So how much do you value this? How much do you, are you involved in today? Choosing the right booth and choosing the right rotational process. Yeah, now, <coughs> I, I pick all my own pools that I use uh, based on availability, and, uh, and I like to do that. I, I do uh, select for A2, A2, um, so that's not the top criteria, but uh, I'm a firm believer that you have to have the best. You, you have to pick the best pool that you can read, and also know what your herd is, so pick pools that complement your herd. more than the other, but as a, as a group, each bull, if they've got production, high fat, high protein, and B2, then they're not uh, Gary, do you feel, after many years of rotational crossbreeding, do you feel like uh, you reach a kind of homogeneity in, in your herd? Because one thing that some farmers think is that well, if I start crossbreeding, I will lose homogeneity in my farm. I will have big cows, small cows, round, rounded cows. And that can happen uh, in the first generation when you start. But now that you are into the process in many years, maybe you have better experience than anyone else about how the standardization of, of the system has worked. Yeah, so our, my cows are probably no bigger than uh, a herd of commercial horses. They're not the big, giant cows. They're not the big show ring cows. Uh, they're just probably compared equally to a commercial Holstein cow. Bigger than a jersey, but not, not like the show ring. And uh, another thing I want to, tell, to ask you, of course, is uh, uh, do you think that uh, following this rotational system is easy compared to the normal, I would say, breeding plan of a pure breeding? So uh, some people would say, well, I, I feel like I could be uh, uh, involved into some complicated things. Uh, is it complicated to follow up this three-way rotational breeding system? If, if I can do it, anybody can do it. So pretty for me it's pretty simple um, that whoever breeds our cows whoever is here on the dairy if they're involved in any way in the, in the reproduction side of it they they know that in my system for every cow if she's sired by a whole team she gets bred to a mongolia if she's sired by a mongolia she gets bred to the bred and she gets bred back to the so i put it in place so people can't mess it up and it's and simple, and I can remember. Very good. Uh, Gear, uh, the, the same uh, question to you. Like, uh, uh, how much uh, uh, do you value the, the, when you pick up the bulls? Do you look at the index uh, of the bulls and do you, you choose the bulls depending on their selection index? So it's not, as I said before to Gear, it's not just to put together three breeds and that will work, but it needs to be done with with a, with a breeding strategy in mind. Is it correct? Do you agree with that? I agree. Uh, together with my breeding advisor, we set some uh, some recommends for each breed uh, and then uh, put into a mating plan and then it's running almost automatically. Um, we use uh, we, use, we want to produce 150 heifers uh, for milk, milking uh, every year, uh, 100 for ourselves and 50 for sale, and then the rest of the cows are bred with beef. Um, and uh, this system has a lot of, yeah, this mating plan has a lot of uh, automatic options. So, yeah, it's really easy to use. and. Uh, there's no inbreeding and everything. No, of course not. And how how do you manage to stay exactly in the same rotational system? I mean, like just follow the breeding plan as you say. 
Yeah. That, that's it. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, yourself is it is it only yourself in, in seminating the cows or, or do you have a breeding technician or no we have a breeding technician coming from Viking and we we order him by a, a touch screen that uh, yeah and also we can order it from the phone and then the mating plan is online and so everything runs by almost by itself. Oh, you guys uh, in, in Denmark, you are way too up technological. Uh, uh, we are still visiting the farms with our car and the catalog and <laughs> push the farmers and check if this is the best bull for you. And uh, I see Gary laughing, but it, that's, got, that's the old way is still working here in Italy anyway. And Scott, uh, 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 what about you? So uh, I, I assume that you have the same uh, experience like the other two guys about choosing the bulls and following a certain breeding strategy to pick up the bulls and not only putting the three breeds together, right? Yeah, we didn't, I guess we didn't copy everything from Gary, but uh, we breed the other direction. We started with all Holstein, everything went Swedish red, and the Swedish red all go Montbilliard, and then back to Holstein again. Um, we just didn't want to have the calving issues on the mature cows like we were having takes care of it pretty fast with the Swedish Red. And as far as uh, choosing a bulls, you know, we we're trying to use as much A2A2 as possible. And also we really watch their uh, rump angle and thorough width mm -hmm. with calving because we have so many cows at one time. And, uh, you know, we'll pick just a few bulls to use at a time. And, you know, we might have a canister with 200 straws of Oh. Swedish red, and we just every cow that needs Swedish red, we get the same bull until we go to the next one. I I wish I would be your semen salesman, uh, you know, <laughs> selling two two hundred stoves at a time. It may make me dream of, but uh, <laughs> just just kidding, Scott. But um, uh, you mentioned a two a two, and, and Gary mentioned the same. So, do you guys get an extra pay for a two a two milk, or is that because you forecast uh, that it will be important in the future. Right? That, that, that's a question that just came now from, from listening to your words. Well, we're not, we're not getting a premium, which we're not all A2, A2 either, but they are bottling some A2 milk um, just about an hour from here right now. So maybe someday we'll get in on that. Okay, so so far they're not paying you any extra for the A2 milk. That's correct. But but you, you feel like it will, it will come. Well, it's a good possibility. And, you know, I've talked to several people who, who have kids or whatever that actually were able to drink milk again because they could buy the A2A2. So yeah, yeah. I think it's real. Yeah, I see I see that uh, you guys in US, you have uh, uh, a, a, a good sales of A2 milk into the, the uh, free, um, into the Walmart or the, the big uh, mall, so probably that's an increasing issue as well for the other uh, countries. I even asked Gert. Gert, can you connect very quickly? Uh, uh, just a quick question to you. Is A2, A2, is, uh, is it an issue in Denmark? Or? Uh, only in a very narrow production. Oh, okay. So it's small, niche market. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and uh, following the rotation, I, we go to Filippo now. And Phil, uh, how do you manage the breeding uh, uh, selection of your bulls? Or who is responsible, or how do you how do you pick up the bulls, and how do you uh, mate the bulls to your farm to your cows? So we have a genetic advisor to tell me which better feed for my breeding bulls, and. Uh, I decided for I decided with him the best bull for the best meat, of course for the best cheese in the future, the best Parmesan Reggiano. And I think it's easier because it's just one bull for single breed. Um, and I say at the beginning we start with Viking red on heifers and Montbillard on the cows. Just to I see. Uh, 
of course I don't ask you about A2 milk because all your milk goes to the cheese factory, so you transform the milk into parmesan. But I assume that you look, at, for example, the double B casein for the profile of the bull. Yeah, yeah. Always, at least. Uh, but then we, yeah. we have a, a noise back. From Sorry. The... Okay, better. Yes. So yeah, all the meat goes to cheese. Cheese, yeah, exactly. So, so you are picking up the bulls with the double B, the K, 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 Z, double B. Yeah, just bulls which with the K, Z. Yeah, of course, that makes sense, of course. Uh, there's a, a very quick question only to Scott. Uh, Scott, are you connected with us? Yes. Uh, yeah. There was a question from the web from one of the audience, Julie Klassen, that says, uh, uh, now that you mention warm weather in Texas, do you have any impression of how the crossbred cows cope with very hot summers compared with bulls? It's not even a comparison. Um, they just... I, they just handle it better. The Holsteins were always looking for a cooler place and a wetter place. Especially the Montbilliards, they don't seem to care if it's hot or cold. So they perform well. They they can they can keep up better even in the in the hot weather, right? Correct. Right. But do you think that has something to do with the with the the size of the cow? Maybe because they are. Is a bit smaller than, than the whole thing, probably. I don't know, but the Montbilliards, you know, they're pretty thick. Oh, ah, yeah. yeah. So, which I can see why, you know, if we get a cold rain, we'll hardly even go down and milk, where with the Holsteins, we'd lose five or six pounds and yeah. take a week to get it back. Yeah, I see. We go back to Gary now, and um, I, I want to make you, Gary, and, and the other guys, of course, uh, a very uh, quick overview about uh, the breeding strategy and the economics. Uh, uh, Gary, since uh, uh, you started ProCross, uh, did you change anything of your management strategy? Uh, for example, uh, lowering the, 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 the waiting, voluntary waiting period or changing something in the dry pen of the cows or something like that? Did you change anything? Crossbred cows gave you opportunity to change something in the management? Yeah, with, with the reproduction side, it has, but um, you still, um, like any animal, milk, beef, whatever they eat, you still have to do a good job providing comfort, water, and whatever else they need. But if you do have everything that, that any other animal requires, you're going to get just that much more out of the program cows, I think. Uh, so the, the management was more. Uh, not having to mess with the fresh cows as much, um, just kind of let them do their thing. Uh, we milk them four times a day, so there's a little more you know, uh, oxytocin letdown, the stimulation. Um, I think that helps us a little bit, and that's about it. You say four, four times a day. Our fresh cows, we milk the fresh cows four times. Oh. And you consider fresh uh, until how many days after calving? 30 to 35. Okay. okay. And, and, and then, the second... And then, yeah. Sorry, what? Sorry. No, no, no. Keep, keep going. Keep going. Sorry. And then just moving the voluntary waiting period back to 75 days and, yeah. and, and no program until 150. That's good. And the second question again for you, Gary, is uh, uh, did the, the, the ProCross uh, uh, decision gave you the opportunity to expand, to grow? In your herd. So since the day you started uh, up today, have you been growing in your herd? Uh, and you and you relate this to, to the season of crop for you? Um, I, I do because because that's all I've done. I jumped in with both feet. So to me, the only answer is because of the pro cross. But in in April of '98, we had 241 milking, and we had a test day last week. And between Three dairies where it's 3,200 cows milking now. Oh, you mean 3,200? Yes, sir. Oh. Just, 
just the six bar exterior is yeah, yeah, yeah. 2300. Yeah. The original theory that I started on is over 900. So Procross, can, can we say that Procross has helped you to expand your herd? Absolutely. <clears throat> and over over the last four years, too, not only have we expanded, but after over the last four years, uh, we've been able to sell over 1,100 peppers. Well, that's a, that's a good extra income. Yes. That's, a, that's a very good check. Okay, Gary, uh, go to Gary. Let's go to Gert. Gert, same question for you. So uh, uh, the third question was, did you change anything in your management strategy by having the cross-red cows? Uh, we changed a lot. Uh, also in the housing of the cows, so it's hard to say what is the ma main factor, but, uh, but we have grown from 100 cows to now almost uh, 350 without buying any animals and we have been using a lot of beef semen to try not to produce too many heifers so the, our biggest trouble has been to have too many excess heifers that it was a, a low value on the danish market because the danish market asks for holstein cows uh, or heifers uh, but now there's a market for live uh, Procross cows at the same value or higher than Holstein. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Um, you hear me? Yeah, now loud and clear. Now. Okay, I, I repeat. Are you still in the process of growing? Expanding or you 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 want to be stable with the 350 cows? We would like to be stable, but I I always try to say that. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it will not happen. And, and the second question, the main uh, question that I uh, I mentioned before to, to Gary uh, is uh, you consider, of course, you already mentioned that, but you consider that Procross was important in your uh, ability, capability to expand. So uh, it's probably, it probably would have gone differently without Procross. I think so. May, maybe would have sold less beef calves or, yeah. Uh, one question uh, uh, from myself, uh, Gert. Uh, uh, I think you are under strict uh, regulation about how many cows and how many hectares of land, right? Yes. Yeah. So that's probably not a, 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 also a, a factor that can limit the, the expansion of the farm. Yes, so the less young cows you have, the more milking cows you can have on your farm. So that's yeah. a factor. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know the rule and probably it's not exactly the same all over the world, so I just want you to mention. And go to Scott uh, now. Uh, Scott, same question for you is uh, uh, by Having uh, pro cross cows, did you manage to, to change something in your management procedure, in your management system, uh, because of the of the cows that you decide to have? It's the biggest thing is when we're calving cows, uh, they're just not a whole lot of work. You just don't pull many calves. Uh, on our mature cows, if they don't maybe have a touch of milk fever or a presenting wrong, we just never put a calf, and very few on the heifers, which they're typically bred sex semen or, or Angus. Um, we, we hardly pull any calves on those. We just don't have the sick cow problems. So that's, that's been a big change. And uh, uh, I, I also ask you if uh, by choosing crossbreeding years ago, did you had the opportunity to expand, to grow, uh, in your uh, number of cows because of that, you feel that? We have. One of our biggest problems, though, was with our heifers on pasture, we really kind of struggled to get them AI'd um, with much success. But we uh, started using SCR co activity collars here about five, six years ago, and that 
works tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. Now we've got too many heifers. Uh, you, do you have a market for your heifers, or is it difficult so far? Yeah, we've been we've been growing some, and uh, just recently we've been selling a few heifers, but the market's a little soft too. Yeah. Yeah. Milk price is low now. Well, it's all over the place this year. Yeah. Yeah, I think. I think. I don't want to ask you how much because otherwise we get into a big trouble here, and uh, and then there is a conversion because you make the price in in gallons, I think, and uh, and in Europe we, we we normally we speak about kilograms of liters of milk, but anyway the situation is much uh, uh, the same all over the world. And uh, Phil, uh, back to you. Uh, yeah, did you did you change any of your management system because of? Your crossbred cows and yeah, so um, I'm starting to use the pit bulls because it was turning an overcrowding and um, yeah, uh, in the last three years uh, we sell 50 heifers and cows in milking, but uh, I mean I I discussed with my dad and we decide to use just beef bulls and also we decide to build uh, another farm for milk colder cows. Oh, you mean a third? The third yeah. farm? Yeah, third farm. We start making the, the 20th of May this year. So there's no need for me, there, there, there is no need for me to ask you if you uh, had the, the chance to grow because you started from one farm then you build the second one, and now you're just opening the third daily. So you, 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 you are getting bigger and bigger. Well, we're getting busier and busier. <laughs> but that's because the, the Swiss market is asking more and more uh, Parmesan cheese? Yeah, yeah. So uh, they want to uh, make it double the quantity because it's not enough now, the product. Uh, so now we we are selling 50 ton per year. Uh, in wow. In next year we are turning on 100 ton. Wow. Well, I, I'm sorry for the two uh, U.S. guys because they never taste your cheese. But we will we will ship something over the overseas. But I know that Gerd has been there with the family, so he can remember the taste of the cheese. Do you remember, Gerd? I remember it was very delicious. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Very appreciate so, so, Filippo, we have to, to ship some, some Parmesan to Gary and Scott because now they, they look like they want to taste it because not only for the Swiss market. We have to find a way. Christmas gift. Yeah, yeah. I'll send you my address. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, uh, we are in the last part of, uh, of uh, our uh, webinar, our conversation. Um, do you feel like, uh, uh, Gary, we, will, we, we go back to you, uh, today uh, the whole dairy uh, uh, market speaks about sustainable farming and that was one of the issues and, and the title of our uh, webinar. Um, do you feel like uh, to be sustainable uh, is related to Procross? Do you feel that Procross is involved in sustainable farming? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so healthy animals, you're going to have a lower cull rate. Uh, lower cull rate requires less efforts to keep the dairy full. Um, that has a less, uh, smaller carbon footprint. And then when we throw on the, uh, the less dry matter to get the same milk or the same energy corrected milk is, is a different breed. Um, there's also California is pretty important. There's a, there's a, a water side of it. Too. So if it takes a, uh, if you consume less feed to get the same milk, then it won't need, uh, need as much. You're, you're kind of doing your part on the saving the water side, too. So I absolutely think the pro cross is a more sustainable water. Uh, you mentioned before. Uh, um, longevity at the beginning of our conversation uh, and you said we improved the, the health the general health so the cows are living 
uh, longer. Yeah. But then in the recent talking, uh, everybody of you have, uh, say that there's no room for, for a big increase, for a big uh, uh, drawing uh, because of the market price, the milk price is not that good, or because of the land restriction like, like for here. So do you feel that today, after a year of cross breeding, do you feel that longevity is no longer a goal for you because you already reached that point? No, I, I, it's still a goal. It's still something to work on um, because we also do uh, beef on dairy, <clears throat> and so there's there's other revenue streams. That, you know, if we could get these cows to average ten lactations, that would be great. Then we that's just less heifers that we need to have, and, and more beef or something else we can do um, with the, with the animals. Uh, oh, I think it's still something to work on, still something to strive for, and it just opens up a few more options for you, a few more things to do. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, same question for you as, as usual. Uh, uh, do you uh, feel like uh, uh, having pro cross or crossbred cows it goes along with sustainable farming? So is it is in is in agreement with the sustainable issues that today are dominating the, the agenda in our uh, marketplace. Yeah, I think uh, I think Gary nailed it. It's uh, I'm I'm thinking the exact same thing about the cows and the and we are still just pushing, uh, seeing how old can we make the cows. Uh, yeah, so the the longer the average life of the cow can be. Uh, yeah, the less heifers, the more opportunities we have with the rest of the farm. So, so it's still a goal, and I think the our goal for culling rate is a uh, is to be somewhere around 20 or 25 percent, uh, at least for now. And then we'll take it from there. When if we go lower than 20, we'll see what happens. How far are you from the the, the goal of 25 percent? Uh, the last 12 months we have a calling rate of 21.6. Oh. So oh, my God, 21.6. So we, oh. we are slowly getting there. Oh, slowly. <laughs> Those are amazing numbers to do my ears. I, I see that Gary is, is knocking the, the head and say, oh, that 20, that's really amazing. Uh, Scott, uh, uh, again to you. Uh, What's your feeling about uh, having uh, crossbred cows uh, and uh, sustainable farming? Those two things, they go along, uh, according to our guys. Well, I think the, the big thing for us is, you know, number one is feed efficiency. You know, we're probably, those studies, I believe, came out that they are 8% more efficient. Well, 8% on 50 pounds of dry matter is... I mean, Holstein is eating 54, so, I mean, that's a big, big plus right there. And then uh, also the coal rates are, you know, we're running, been running about 28% for quite a few years. So. <coughs> Pardon me. Do you feel, personally, uh, do you feel proud of, of having those more efficient cows? Like, you feel like being part of a change, like we are getting more environmental friendly by, by raising our cows in a more efficient way? Do you feel like that? Well, yeah, it's, it's a good feeling for sure, you know, and, um, you know, with having our cows outside most of the year, they, you know, they're in such good, good uh, condition and good feet and legs. And I had one uh, consultant here that she said she'd never seen a herd of cows with as good of foot score as what we have. Uh, uh, you, you just uh, raised a question to my mind, but it will come to you, back to you later. I want to ask now the same question to Filippo. Uh, Filippo, about sustainable farming and your uh, personal experience, how do you feel uh, about that? Well, we have to remember that uh, your organic farm has to go under a very strict uh, regulation by the, for, for producing the feed for the street market. So probably uh, you are 
more involved into this sustainable farming. Yeah. So uh, feeding, <laughs> you know, ninety percent of forage for us and respect for farming general general rules that I just can uh, feed the cows with dry feed or fresh, of course, in the summertime. Um, the cross cross cows are really nice also because they can convert uh, four four feet and they still make milk and they get pregnant. And that for me is really important because uh, I'm used to to give them 2.5 kilo of concentrate. Uh, oh, okay. that's really low. Yeah, yeah, that's low. Uh, at first time, uh, when we start farming in the Swiss way, we were worried about uh, cows can still alive, but they can still alive and also they can um, make milk with 2.5, just if you have a good forage, and of course if you have a more efficient animal, you can get something more. Also, my cows can pass the night month or year, and for cross, my cows love pasture, and they are nice, and that makes a good shop window for my company. Oh, you mean people driving around and seeing the cows outside? They yeah, like it. Wow, it's like an advertising, permanent advertising. Yeah, not so bad. Okay, guys, I know you're tired, but only two questions more, and then we will free you to go back to your day. And the two U.S. guys, they have their day ahead of them, because uh, it's the morning right by now, and uh, so I don't want to keep this uh, too long. Uh, back to Gary. First uh, question to you, Gary, is uh, um, there was a, a, a raising... Uh, issue coming from stock that was feed efficiency. Uh, uh, in your personal experience, have you seen those Procross cows being more feed efficient compared to the hosting? Like, they can convert the, the feeding better. Yeah, and um, we, we did a, a little study about eight years ago. Um, in, in California, it's getting a little weird with the uh, being able to ship milk, you kind of have to almost buy the rights. Uh, I belong to the GFA Dairy Farm in America. And, and you have a base. And so there was two herds, two smaller herds in Northern California. Uh, one was a Cronross and one was a Holstein. And I bought them. I did a expansion. And we kept the cows apart. We kept the Cronross apart from the Holstein with our feed system and keep track of the Holstein cows and the Procross cows on test day had almost identical energy correct in milk, but our Procross cows did it with 4% less dry matter. Oh, that's so, quite that's quite a lot. Yeah, there was a there was a young man here from Holland doing an internship with us and so he kept track of everything. And uh, uh, pretty good. That was just here on the farm though, but four percent would get the same energy correct as milk what we saw right here right well 4% on each cow 4% yeah it, well it was a group of cows so yeah they're, yeah they're, but but we have to consider 4% on each cow and you milk 3000 and something so it's, it's going to yeah. make a difference yeah. Yeah. that's going to make a difference for them and it's going to make a difference for your wallet too. yeah and feed is a it's a big cost for us so Yeah, one question that was not planned but came from the, the, the audience is about uh, a profit, but uh, I assume that I don't have to ask you guys if you consider this uh, solution more profitable, otherwise you would not have been doing that for many, many years. And your words now on feed efficiency confirm that those cows are really more profitable. That's it wasn't more profitable, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you would have stopped. Uh, Gert, what about feed efficiency according to your experience? Yeah, but I haven't done any tests, so I, I can only, yeah, 
we are, we yeah. are, yeah, it's only on my fee feelings, yeah, but a bit, okay. but, uh, but we are, we are managing the feed efficiency every day uh, uh, online and according to the Danish system, the, the feed efficiency is measured in percentage, so they're, they're performing pretty well, uh, around 100% I should I should not ask you, but I ask you: Are they profitable cows? Are those cows profitable for you? Of, co of course they are, but I, I don't want to to cancel questions coming from the, the audience. You know? Yeah, it's hard to say. But for me, they are profitable. But I have I have no pure bread to compare. No. Them. Okay. Okay. Scott, you you raised the question before the issue before about feed efficiency so that that's something that's important for you uh, how how much uh, those crossbreds are efficient in converting the forage into milk according to your experience well we never really did any studies on it but you know we in our hot climate we're we're pretty good at growing poor quality forages except for our pasture can be pretty good but um, these cows can uh, convert the poor quality forages to, to milk a lot better than the Holsteins do. I see. Well, uh, I should not ask the same to Filippo, but I will, of course. And uh, uh, you, Filippo, you already mentioned before that your cows have to stay on, on pasture, grazing system, and they can only receive a small quantity of grain uh, per cow per lactation. So I assume that uh, you already see a better feed efficiency on your cross by cow. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, well, actually, I'm still um, seeing this uh, every day uh, because uh, I'm just making the second generation cows that have to now. So, yeah, I'm still seeing every day this. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, last question for all of you, starting from Gary again. And this is the, the, the open question that will give you the possibility to, to answer uh, as much as you can and as much as you want. Uh, if a farmer would like to start crossbreeding today, what would be your best suggestion for her or for him? Like, start with part of your cows, start with 100%, uh, what, whatever you feel like would be a good suggestion, a good advice for a farmer that would like to start crossbreeding today. Gary? Yeah, I would say just start. Uh, however you want to do it, just start, because if you really look at the numbers, if you look at the cows, don't start 100%. I think every study that's been done has shown I don't know why somebody wouldn't start on this. If they didn't start on this, just start. It just well, of course, you know that some people is, I don't want to say afraid, but concerned about what the neighbors would think about their starting crowd breeding. And I, and I assume all of you have experienced something like that, like your father or your friend, longtime friend, they say, hey, you are just cross breeding because you are not a top farmer. You know, you are like a second, second quality, second level farmer. So please, Gary, can you tell something about this? Like, don't be yeah. afraid. Yeah, don't be afraid. I've been, I've been getting pointed at and smirked at for 20 years now, from over 20 years, uh, and I've never do anything different. I've never changed. Cross cross, they monitor, they monitor. Thank you, Gary. And uh, Gary, same question for you. What would be your suggestion for a guy that would like to start crossbreeding uh, right today? Uh, I would say, like Gary, get started. Uh, make a good plan for, for which way of the rotation you would start. If you start like Gary or like Scott, uh, can maybe make a small difference in how the size of the cows will will turn out uh, but there's a lot of 
qualified people to help with that now. Um, and then, yeah, I normally say that the color of the cows are, are many, but the milk is white, and the, yeah, it's the milk that we sell. So, yeah, that's my opinion. Yeah, thank you, Gert. Same question for you, Scott. What would be your best suggestion for anyone that would like to start crossbreeding right now? Yeah, I would definitely jump in at 100%. Um, you know, you've got good research that has been repeated over and over, and I'm not aware of uh, too many people that went in 100% and then quit. So that's kind of my thought on it. Don't be shy and just get in. <laughs> exactly. Which I've never really cared what my neighbors thought. So. No, no, no. And uh, Filippo, uh, what, what about you? What would be your suggestion uh, if anybody would like to start for us reading? Uh, so when we started, I was convinced, and uh, still now, um, my, my farm friends and neighbors are skeptic about it. I think also, also you are scary, Scott and Gary. And so they asked me a question about crossbreeding. They come to me and this is my heart how I feel about it and I always say to try in their own farms and because just in this way you can notice really the benefit and I also uh, and I always say yeah, to, to start from good cows and choose really the best moves otherwise you don't get the, the result. Excellent guys so it's uh... 521 here in Italy so it's gonna get in dark now it's probably already dark in Denmark and uh, it's gonna be a hopefully a good day for the US guys in California and Texas I want to thank personally Gary Osmundson and uh, Gerd Lassen Scott Opitz and Filippo Peveri for the time they have given to us and uh, has been so kind in answering all my boring questions. And uh, I hope, uh, guys, uh, uh, that this COVID situation will end very soon and we will be able to get in touch by person very, very soon. So thank you for your participation. I leave the last words to Stefan. And uh, Claudio, thanks a lot for your time also. Uh, I think you, you are just a complete uh, super job you're used to that's fantastic and of course to our four panelists uh, we, we uh, thank you again um, it's not the first time that you welcome cra crowds on uh, this time it's on uh, on this COVID free uh, uh, tour but usually it's in your dairy uh, Gary, Gil, uh, Scott, uh, Filippo you've been uh, welcoming a lot of uh, groups on your dairy to show uh, what you uh, accomplished and, uh, and that's uh, all the time it's fantastic and we are really uh, grateful of this. This time again, it was a, a fantastic occasion to, to uh, see you guys. Uh, I see with Jeff that the, your, the next generation is ready to jump in. I see uh, your little uh, uh, baby, so uh, that's fantastic. And uh, yeah, thank you all again and uh, we'll be in touch. For all of you who are listening, I uh, must tell you it has been uh, a lot of uh, people following us. Uh, we thank you for all the audience and all the attendees, participants that uh, either on Zoom or on Facebook were with us. Uh, uh, this um, webinar has been recorded, so it will be available for later for anyone who would like to uh, listen to it again. Claudio, it's my, it's my turn for the post dipping, uh, guys. So you have to go. <laughs> you have to go. go. Yeah. Yeah. Cows on the back waiting for the post dipping. Fantastic, Claudio. So, uh, bye, see guys. You guys, have fun, and uh, we'll see you soon. I uh, hope uh, when the, all the thing is over. Thanks. Bye, okay. guys. Bye. Bye, bye. Bye. Oh, bye.